Hi, I'm uh, Diane Kresh. I'm the director of Arlington Library and welcoming you to this evening's program. A uh, couple of logistical things. We are being filmed tonight by um, whatever we're called, uh, Arlington County's uh, own cable station, and it'll be then available for streaming later on, on your Fios or your cable channel. Uh, we will have copies of the book available, courtesy of Barnes & Noble, after the program, and Beth will sign them and answer additional questions and be an opportunity to talk a little bit more about, about the book. Uh, we are also grateful to the Friends of the Library, as always, for all of the programming that we do throughout the year, the summer reading program that's fabulously successful for our children, as well as all of the adult author programs. And you may not be aware, but their second annual book sale is this week, later this week, so it's always a lot of fun. We refer to it as Arlington's oldest recycling program. Uh, Always lots of neat things to, to pick up. So that starts uh, for members Thursday night and then it runs through the weekend. So if you have a chance, stop by. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, if you've listened to NPR in the last uh, few months or read articles in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, uh, Beth Macy will be familiar to, to many of you. And her remarkable story about the collapse of the American furniture industry and its human cost in her book, Factory Man, how one furniture maker battled offshoring, stayed local, and helped save an American town. Uh, what interested in me when I first came upon the book in a New York Times review earlier this summer was the fact that this isn't just a Virginia story, it's a national story, and we've been experiencing it for a long time. And the book, in fact, is a remarkably detailed, vividly described book, look rather, at how industrial America once set the standard for the world, but then hit the harsh wall of cheaper labor and standards found overseas. I don't want to give away too much for those of you who haven't finished the book, but I can say Factory Man could serve as a guide to restoring a lot of small American towns that have their own version of the Bassett Furniture Company. And hopefully there are a lot more John Bassetts out there. He's certainly very, very colorful and a memorable character if you've read the book. His bullheaded attitude was described by someone in the book as always, boys, you better get in the wagon with me or I'll make you wish you had. <laughs> Definitely someone you want on your team. Beth Macy is herself the daughter of a factory worker who has gone on to win more than a dozen awards for her down-to-earth, muckraking journalism, and we mean muckraking in a good way, uh, in the Roanoke Times and many national magazines. With Factory Man, her talents were recognized even before publication, when Columbia's Journalism School and the Neiman Foundation awarded Beth with the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award. Now we get to hear how a book like this comes to life and what other powerful, true-to-life stories we can hope to read soon from Beth Macy. Please welcome a great Virginia storyteller, Beth Macy. Super, thank you. Thank you so much, that was fantastic. And I love to speak at a library because I think the first place I fell in love with language was in the back room of the Urbana Public Library where I was um, memorizing Shel Silverstein or something like that, writing a biography on Louis Armstrong. Um, and somebody asked me tonight earlier, what's been the best part about writing this book? And it was actually, in August, I got, I got to go back to my hometown, which is this little factory town called Urbana, Ohio, and I got to read at the library. And I, it was standing room only. My high school English teachers came. All these parents of friends came who really sort of looked like raised me, kind of. I, I wasn't quite a feral child, but I wasn't that far from it. And it was just, oh, libraries. I love libraries, so thank you. I can tell this is a great one. Um, so tonight I'm going to tell you a story with pictures. It's a story about globalization that blends a dash of memoir uh, with social history and some contemporary business reporting. Or as my agent put it when he first read my book proposal, holy shit, Macy, you found Moneyball with furniture. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on why I framed the story the way I did around the voiceless millions who lost their jobs to offshoring. Uh, it starts with my story, the little ragamuffin, that's me in Urbana, 
Uh, my grandmother lived on that side of the driveway, and we lived on that side of the driveway. And I grew up poor, the daughter of a factory worker mom. She soldered airplane lights when the economy was good, and she usually babysat and waitressed really badly when it wasn't. She said really badly. Um, I was the first in my family to go to college, and I did it thanks to full financial aid, a few scholarships um, that I believed really pro propelled my um, move into the middle class. I'm not sure that leap would have been possible had I been born 15 years later, and I'm pretty sure it, it wouldn't be possible at all today, um, which explains why I'm not your typical business writer. I will interview the CEOs and the politicians and um, the professors, and I do in, the, in my book, but I start with the people on the ground, and that's always been my, report, my approach to reporting. I've always done that. And because in my marrow, I don't think the CEO or the professor is more important than the guy sweeping his, his office at night. And, um, and I'm sorry, Supreme Court. I, they got it right yesterday, but I really don't think um, corporations are people. So that's just, I, I lay it all out at the beginning of the book. That's who I am. You know, if you've got a problem with it, you, you might want to go to another book. Um, one of my favorite quotes about journalism is this from a historian named Will Durant. And he wrote, civilization is a stream with banks. The stream is sometimes filled with blood from people killing, stealing, shouting, and doing the things historians usually record, while on the banks, unnoticed, people build homes, make love, raise children, sing songs, write poetry, and even whittle statues. The story of civilization is the story of what happened on the banks. So Factory Man just happens to be set, most of it, along the banks of the Smith River in Henry County, Virginia. And we have, how many people from Bassett or have lived in, you're from Bassett too? Oh my gosh, four? Oh, thank you. We call it the Bassett diaspora. They always show up, like no matter where I am, there are people from Bassett. So. So for years, I was a longtime reporter at the Roanoke Times, and, and, and Bassett and Henry County is about an hour south of Roanoke. So for years, I watched my business reporter colleagues um, swoop down to write a story every time a factory closed. And they were sad stories, and um, you know, before you knew it, Martinsville and Henry County had the highest unemployment rate in the state. In 2012, I had a friend who was a photographer named Jared Soares. He's now based in DC, but at the time he was based uh, right around the corner from me in Roanoke. And he had taken it upon himself to document the aftermath of globalization. So he would, he would, uh, he was hoping to write a book. He wasn't sure what he was going to do with it, but he started going, traveling down there three times a week. And uh, 20,000 jobs had left that region since 1989, which ended up being half of the jobs in that community. First in textiles and then in furniture. It still has the highest unemployment rate. So what happens to a community when half of its jobs go away? You bump into people like Samuel Watkins. He'd been among the last furniture workers laid off in 2012 in Martinsville. When I met him in 13, the AP had just announced new data sh that showing that four in five American adults will face poverty sometime in their lifetimes. A month earlier, MIT economist David Otter had released a study documenting the skyrocketing rates of disability and wage deflation in areas that were really particularly hit by trade, like Martinsville. So finally, Samuel had some numbers to back up his story like he needed it. Um, he was 61, he was gardening, making $8.50 an hour. He was carrying his tools around the day I met him in the back of a dented up Ford Explorer, I think it was 1999. His wife had been laid off from furniture work and she was waiting to hear back whether she was getting a uh, disability. And Sam had just maxed out his credit card to have an infected tooth pulled. The world was now flat, yes, and we could all get blue jeans and bedroom suits a little bit cheaper thanks to it but millions of working Americans have been flattened in the process. To find that story in the media, though, you had to read it between the lines of the monthly job reports, the page three crime briefs, the wire stories about Bangladeshi garment fires. 
So this was a fire right in, um, in Bassett. In 2011, police arrested a 34-year-old man for setting fire to an abandoned Bassett furniture factory. He'd been trying to, um, to, to pull out the copper wire casings to, to resell on the black market. And instead, he'd started this fire. He didn't mean to do it. He was, and I just found out this detail the other day. He showed up to the scene of his crime on a bicycle. That's how, that's how desperate he was. Um, he left in a police car with burns on his face. And um, when news of this fire uh, went out in the county, displaced workers converged to watch it burn. And one said it was like going to a funeral for everyone you knew. Most of the displaced were scraping by, uh, many of them working part-time if they were employed at all. The, the new job numbers came out the other day. Um, that number's out. Seven million American workers are working part-time, you know, wish they were working full-time. Uh, so this is Mary Red, a former textile mill office worker who now works 30 hours a week as a receptionist with no benefits. She was picking up catering jobs on the side when we met in 2012, and she was telling me about this par party she'd recently helped cater for Martinsville's Elite, and um, she actually ran into the former CEO of Taltex, where she had once worked when she made good money. And um, what she said to him literally made me gasp. She said, if Taltex were to open back up today and the only way I could get there would be to crawl on my belly like a snake, I would do it. Francis Kissy had lost six jobs in 18 years to closings, first textiles, then furniture, she even worked at a movie gallery, which eventually closed. She was a manager there. Then she worked at a call center called StarTech, um, which ultimately was relocated to the Philippines. To make ends meet, she was taking in boarders when I met her and going back to school with the help of Trade Adjustment Assistance, or TAA. She was in her mid-50s, um, working toward a certificate in child care. She, opened, she hoped to open a child care center, and she thought that was something that would not be offshore, she hoped. Um, and, and looking into TAA, which was a federal program designed in the 60s, um, only a third of the displaced workers even participate in it. It's supposed to be the federal government's response to mitigating what happens when Americans lose jobs because of trade um, through no fault of their own. Uh, but the unemployed people I interviewed found T TAA to be ineffective, out of touch, um, I would say impotent even. It was designed in the 60s, and I would argue that it needs a total overhaul, which hardly anyone talks about. It's, I went to one of these, um, this particular um, session, information session, and it was as if the people running it had never actually spoken to um, a laid off worker. That's, um, this is Lane Nunley. He worked for 18 hours, for 18 years at Hooker Furniture, which was in Martinsville, and he was the sample man. That's the person that takes the drawings and makes the prototype in wood and figures out, you know, uh, exactly how to make it. Um, when Hooker closed in 2007 and started importing from China, Vietnam, and Indonesia, Lane used TAA to become a certified auto body mechanic. He went from making $18 an hour with full benefits uh, and profit sharing to $9 an hour with no benefits. When he gets sick, he told me, I write it out and use home remedies. When we met, he hadn't been to the doctor in three years. A, um, a lot of people were making the rounds to area food pantries and still are. Um, they, would, they would show up like between the 20th and the 30th of the month, they would just, there would be lines out the door. Um, the director of this particular pantry told me he could divine what people used to do for work by their disfigurements. The women who'd bent over sewing machines, um, making sweatshirts all day, had humps on their backs, and the men who had culled lumber were missing fingers, many of them. And he said, we're, we're the last, last, last resort to stand in line and get a box of old food. And that, by the way, that's a textile mill conveyor belt uh, converted for use in a food pantry. People were growing their own food, raising chickens, cobbling together a patchwork of under-table jobs. 
Uh, this is Janet Poland. She had been a sharecropper as a little kid. Her parents were sharecroppers. Both she and her parents eventually became furniture workers. She's now unemployed. She w I met her at the food pantry. She was getting one of those boxes of old food to share with her parents, who were 96 and 98 when I met her last year. And they share this salad patch, she calls it, uh, in between their two homes. Uh, and um, her parents are incredible. But Charlie passed away around Christmas, but Mabel just turned 98 last Monday. And um, Janet says of her mother, nobody on earth has worked as hard as my mama. Um, after my newspaper story ran, I did a story. I'm, I didn't meet them for the book, but every, I, I love talking to them because everything they said sort of underscored what I had learned from the book. And um, they're actually going to be in my next book. Um, I, so I wrote this story for the Roanoke Times about cuts in the food stamp program. And I had met her at the food pantry, and I went out and met them. And after the story ran, I, I got a check in the mail from a very generous reader who, um, it was, it was going to be Thanksgiving, he wanted me to take, you know, to help him out with their food bill. So I took this very generous check, which I think was a check probably bigger than any check they'd ever seen in their lives. And she started to cry, and she said, she said, God bless you, a double potion. Among the most ironic of my interviewees were scores of the displaced workers in their 50s and early 60s I'd interviewed who'd done everything asked of them, including retraining, uh, but still had only managed to land part-time work at Walmart, the retailer that had done more to champion offshoring than any other country, uh, company in the world. So this is Wanda Purdue. She was 58 when we met, laid off from Stanley Furniture when it closed in 2010. Her big splurge, she bought all generic ingredients, but she still bought Lux Pinto beans, she told me. And she's the one who asked me, um, Stanley had uh, first had their furniture made in China and then Vietnam and m most recently in Indonesia. So when her job was, uh, the people who replaced her actually work in Indonesia, not China. And she said, um, I'd like you to go there so you can tell me why it is we can't make it here anymore. And that became really the driving question of my book. And towards the end of the book, I do go to Indonesia and I, and I meet the workers there who are not unlike the early workers at Bassett Furniture in 1902. But the other question um, that really propelled me, especially once I met the main character, was, um, was there another way? Hadn't anyone at all fought to keep their workers employed? So it turned out somebody had. He was from the tiny hamlet of Galax, Virginia. And um, from that tiny little town, which is better known for bluegrass and barbecue, it's, they had this huge fiddlers come. Is anybody here from Galax? No, OK. Anybody been to Galax? OK, OK, great, great, great. So from Galax, you all know, it's just a small little former furniture town. He had taken on China um, at the US International Trade Commission, filing what in 2003 was the largest anti-dumping petition in the world. And he, once I met him, whoa. So he's super feisty. Falconerian, and from a strictly storytelling perspective, this factory man seemed to have all the elements uh, for me to write my first book. <laughs> Never mind an HBO miniseries. So when I met him, he was a 75-year-old multimillionaire who genuinely seemed to care about the generations of workers that had made his family wealthy. He said things you don't normally hear out of the mouths of CEOs, like, the fucking chai comms aren't going to tell me how to make furniture. I mean, who says that out loud? <laughs> and what really made me excited is when I f did my research and I really understood that you could tell the whole history of uh, this industry through his family. And so he was from this eponymous company town of Bassett, Virginia. And uh, that's actually the plant that you saw burning in that earlier picture. His, um, that was the first plant he ran when he came back to Bassett after college and a, a, a stint in the Army. His grandfather was J.D. Bassett Sr., a.k.a. Mr. J.D., and he had started the company in what was basically the family's front yard that you see there. Um, the Smith River is in the foreground of the picture uh, in front of the trees. He started in 1902 using free timber from his property and cheap labor, subsistence farmers and former sharecroppers who were eager to join the cash economy. He used the Smith River spitting distance away to move the logs from the, his sawmill 
to the factories, and later he harnessed the steam from the river um, for the boilers. They built a town eventually so people wouldn't have to walk in from the mountains in the pre-dawn. I mean, they used to carry lanterns in the morning as they walked into work. As the first southern furniture maker to hire blacks at the height of Jim Crow, he was progressive, you could say, but he was also wily and shrewd. He paid them half of what he paid the whites, and he gave them the worst jobs, such as here in the finishing room at Stanley Furniture, uh, which he helped his son-in-law, T.B. Stanley, open in 1924. Bassett also, Mr. J.D., personally spawned Hooker Furniture, Vaughn Furniture, Vaughn Bassett, Stanley. Um, he had a hand in all of them. He would sort of get them going, and he would keep stock in exchange, sort of in, entwining his wealth with his competitors. It's pretty interesting. Um, Bassett was the definition of paternalism. Black workers lived in shacks along a snaky hollow road that flooded every time it rained. White workers lived in company homes closer to the factories, and everyone paid their light bills at the company headquarters. Police, cab drivers, street sweepers, street lights, the town doctor, it was all owned and operated by Bassett Furniture Industries. But paternalism could be kind also, um, such as when Bassett Furniture weathered the depression without laying a single person off, which is something you just can't imagine today almost. Uh, according to the little girl in this picture on the left, who's now in her 80s. Mr. J J.D. went around to every worker and surveyed the number of mouths each person had to feed and then cut everybody's salary and their hours accordingly. But no one, like, alone had to suffer. No one lost their job. Everybody took a little bit of a cut. So that was the upward mobility trajectory before globalization. Betty's grandparents had been sharecroppers. Her father was a furniture worker. And Betty herself ended up with a master's degree and a career in social work. She remembers money being so t tight during the Depression that her mom couldn't afford pencils and paper, and she learned how to draw her letters on the condensation of the windows. So Bassett Furniture modernized during World War II and positioned itself to become, uh, and did become, the largest furniture maker in the world. The GIs came home, the American suburbs began to boom, and people needed furniture for those new ranch houses. And there was drama galore, juicy drama, as there usually is in family-run businesses, especially those with millions on the line. And so little John, as the whole town called him, that's him on the right, that's John Bassett III, um, he, could, he couldn't get along with his tempestuous older brother-in-law, Bob Spillman, who was second from the left. And Bob eventually became the CEO of uh, Bassett, grew it, it eventually became Fortune 500. Um, he basically uh, made sure that little John, who was thought at his birth would eventually inherit the company, uh, he basically drove him out and um, made his life a living hell until he left in 1982. And so little John finally quit after a fight that you'll have to read about in the book and decamped to Galax where he resurrected a struggling Vaughn Bassett furniture which had been founded by John's grandfather, Mr. J.D., and his wife's grandfather in 1919. His wife is also his distant cousin. And the only person to raise her voice when little John got kicked out, the family maid. A Bassett quitting Bassett? She muttered as she served the Spillman's Christmas dinner. It ain't right. Like his grandfather, John Bassett III was wily and he was shrewd. He'd arrived in Galax with a dresser-sized chip on his shoulder in an insufferable competitive drive. As more than one of his competitors barked at me when they heard I was writing a book with him as the main character, he's an asshole. <laughs> in the late eight, 90s and early aughts, when Chinese furniture makers started flooding the market with imports that were so cheap, he knew they had to be dumping, and that means that illegally, according to the rules of the WTO, they're selling the furniture cheaper than the cost of the wood to make it uh, in an effort, you know, it, it expressly to put the Americans, to capture the market share and put the American factories out of business. He alone had the audacity to fight back in his industry. He, he knew they were dumping because he'd already had his line workers deconstruct a particular dresser that was threatening to put the whole industry out of business. It was this $100 dresser from Dalian, China. That was the only clue. There was a sticker on the back that said Dalian. That's in northern China. And um, he, he journeyed with his son Wyatt, that's his son Wyatt on the right in the khakis, uh, undercover 
uh, with a friendly uh, a, a Taiwanese translator, that's her third from the left, Rose Maynard, um, and she harbored no love uh, growing up in Taiwan for China. And um, she had married into somebody who had a lot of connections in the furniture industry in Asia, and she knew just what to do to find that $100 dresser. And they went, basically went factory to factory posing as buyers. Um, they were gonna have their furniture made, um, but they're really looking for the source of that cheap chest of drawers. Um, you can read the book and find out exactly how they pulled it off with huge help from uh, a team of trade lawyers. Do we have any trade lawyers in the audience? Sort of. <laughs> ITC? Awesome, okay. Joe Dorn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Joe Dorn was the, he was the main guy. But know this, it took a certified asshole with millions in the bank and a dresser-sized chip on his shoulder to prove that the Chinese were cheating. I didn't know that at the beginning, but once I like dug, 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 uh, I was like, oh, only he could have done this, really. Um, as John Bassett likes to say, quoting General Patton, when in doubt, attack. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, back in Bassett, this, which had been a thriving boom town, uh, morphed from that. Uh, people said on Saturday mornings, um, it was so crowded that it would take you 15 minutes to walk down the street. Is that right, the people from Bassett? Yeah, it was really a busy place. And um, now it looks like that. Um, so one by one, the seven Bassett factories closed as that company followed the path of so many others in the industry. And Bassett Furniture itself, which had factories all over the country, um, ended up putting 8,500 people out of work. Um, elegant homes that had once been occupied by the company founders that used to look like this. And by the way, that's Gracie Wade, second on the left in the white kerchief. Um, who was in the earlier picture. That house now looks like that. And the current owner told me she can't afford to heat it in the winter. The populated, population of Bassett's about a third its former size and more than half of the people in Henry County drive outside of the county, many of them to North Carolina for work. Um, that's Coy Young, the town barber, always a good source. Um, <laughs> He now opens his shop at 5 a.m. in order to serve the many customers who drive outside of the county to work. Um, volunteers pool resources to pay for the town's street lights because the company doesn't pay for them anymore. So over in Galax, John Bassett had won his anti-dumping case and not without copious amounts of more drama in his family, in his industry, in the courts. He not only kept his factory going, he opened up an abandoned plant next door, saving 700 jobs and as many in the town and in the region argue, saving the town. Um, this was actually the scene that my book was supposed to end on. When I wrote my book proposal, I said that I would end with this. And uh, just before, it's a press conference. He's gathered the politicians, and they're, they're in the front row. Those are the factory workers. He's standing on a furniture conveyor belt that's probably been there since 1919. And, and you know, he's announcing that he's, you know, he's gonna hire 115 more workers. And as he told me right before he went on, look, peering over sawdust covered glasses, well, when you never went cheap with the other woman down the street, meaning China, you don't have to come drag ass in back. So that's really how I thought the book would end, but I really fell in love with Bassett, Bassett, the town that isn't so thriving. And um, one day on one of my reporting trips back from Bassett, the real takeaway of what my book should be hit me. Um, and that was that I think nobody was minding the back room of this new global store. When China joined the WTO in 2001, politicians promised Americans it would be, quote, a win-win that our workers would not lose jobs, that we would simply export more goods to China's growing middle class. But few people had ever go, bothered to go back and say, it didn't, didn't really work out that way, did it? Um, we can all get blue jeans and bedroom suits a little bit cheaper now, but few people in Washington had paid attention to pictures like this, to the creeping small town carnage created by acronyms like NAFTA and WTO and an impotent TAA, all of it forged by faraway people who had never bothered to see the full result of what globalization had wrought. That, to me, is the heart of Factory Man. So over the course of two years, I watched factories go from looking like this to this 
abandoned. And then to this, it was uh, set on fire when they were um, tearing it down. And uh, then the demolition process over the course of two years, it was, it was slow. I, 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 but I watched this happen with this particular factory. And then, you know, everything's leveled and grass is grown uh, and a fence is put around it, rendering it unusable. And um, finally to this, which gave me, um, I felt a, a really, that, this is how I decided to end the book. Um, and I'm giving it all away, which now you're not gonna buy it, dang. Um, so uh, quite by accident one day, so, uh, one of my sources said, I wanna show you something. And she drove me up to the outskirts of Bassett um, and she introduced me to Harry Ferguson. And he, he was the guy that had been hired to um, haul what remained of the last factory which was called Bassett Superior Lines, to haul it away and bury it in a ravine um, behind someone's home, who, went, who was a relative of a Bassett and wanted to extend his lawn. And, um, and Bassett Superior Lines was quite storied in the history of Bassett Furniture. It was, it was uh, the, the former plant manager said, we were printing money. I mean, they, it was, they made the low end furniture chuck a luck the workers still remember the sound of the furniture just zooming down the conveyor belt. It was a very cheap, quick, and it was super profitable. They made 1.2 million in profit in one month. And um, so this is how it ended. And at the end of, end of our um, interview, Harry had had set aside a really neat stack of bricks over on the other side, on the other opposite the ravine. And I asked him what, what that was for. And he said, oh, those are the bricks for the people of Bassett that, all, that come by all the time and ask me for one. And um, like commemorative bricks as reminders of the work they'd done and the friendships they'd forged in those factories. Um, but they weren't just for nostalgia's sake. I think they were also proof that unfettered free trade had not been a win-win for everyone. So while the CEOs were cashing bigger checks and the Walmart heirs were accruing wealth equal to that of the bottom 41.5% of American families, the, the American job market um, had hollowed out in many of these trade impacted towns. That's the story, I think, of what happened on the riverbanks. Fer Ferguson picked up one of the bricks from his stack and he chinked off the mortar and then he handed me one um, really sweetly and ceremoniously, um, like he was, like somebody might hand over a sleeping baby really gently. And the brick was warm from the sun and it was solid. And when he looked me in the eye, we didn't say anything, but we both knew that there were people out there still who would crawl on their bellies like a snake if they thought it would bring it all back. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Is it filming now? And I don't. It's in the way it works, and I didn't know. Um, it, it could be a couple years before you know we even know for sure if it's going to be made. So I've just been told to sit tight. But it was very exciting. He sent out a, a tweet in, um, I guess it was early August, recommending that people read it, and he gave it 142 stars, <laughs> which was. I just wanted to add that I, I read the first couple chapters of the book and I said this has to be made into a film. <laughs> Thank so you. I'm glad that he's, Thank you. I hope it, I hope Thank it you. happens. Well, his company has a great track record, yeah. Plato, you know, they did the John Adams and um, great stuff. So fingers crossed. So if, uh, if John Bassett had actually run Bassett Furniture, the big public company, the huge Bassett, do you think he would have fought the same fight or would he have been caught up in the, uh, um, in the wave of globalization that they were caught up in? Yeah. Well, because in, 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 I really try to be ba fair to Bassett Furniture because they are different kinds of entities. Bassett Furniture is a, um, a public company with shareholders, as the CE told me, that have to get profits. We are not a social experiment, he said, which sounds sort of tone deaf, but it's, it is true. 
And um, I tried to give, you know, I tried to really understand the decisions that went into closing all those factories, including some that were still very profitable at the time, because they, they went a totally different way and went into, um, they, uh, they had always sold to the middle and lower middle market, you know, the whole sell to the masses to eat with the classes thing. And they made a really conscious decision. Their response to globalization was to make slightly higher end stuff you know, not quite Ethan Allen, but right before, and to go vertical and to sell, um, to open their own stores, which they have. They've got almost 100 stores now across the country. And um, the, like Bassett Superior Lines Furniture, that was designed, you know, to, to, that was designed to furnish the bedrooms that the GIs came home to, not, not hand carved stuff from Indonesia. And, um, but to your question, um, I've asked John Bassett that too, and he's very careful about not criticizing his relatives, because you know he still has to see them at family dinners, I guess. And um, but there was this one moment every now and then he'd say something that was completely unfiltered. It was rare. It was it was like like a juicy nugget when he did. And we were driving around. It took me about eight months to convince him to meet me in Bassett because I wanted to see it through his eyes. I wanted to see where he got his first haircut and where he went to the movies when he was little and where he grew up and the schools he went to. And I was hoping that he would really like kind of come alive. And what he did most of the tour was like, turn the tape recorder off. I was like, no. And, um, but every now and then he would say, cause he was just very guarded about, he didn't want to come across this gloating that he had done a great thing and his relatives hadn't and um, which, I, which I appreciate. We pulled up, we were driving around Martinsville and we pulled up to an, another abandoned plant called American of Martinsville. And that was a particularly gut-wrenching one because people had shown up for work on Monday morning and the gates were locked. And that was how they found out they lost their jobs. Like they didn't even have the nerve to look them in the eye. That wasn't a Bassett plant, it was a different company. But he said, as we were sitting there looking at this crooked, like j jobs wanted, you know, like where were you supposed to, there was a sign, a crooked rusty sign that said where you're supposed to go if you were going to turn in a job application. And he said, I know we had to close some factories, but I don't think we had to close them all. And so um, there's, a, there's a gentleman who was running a Bassett plant in um, Dublin, Georgia, named Buck Gale, who grew up in Bassett. His father had run the WM Bassett plant in Martinsville, which is another chapter of family drama. And um, he had, he knew, he saw globalization coming and he figured out how to make, how to make furniture really profitably. And it was before I, he, Ikea was so huge here, but he had gone out into his workshop in his backyard and had figured out this new process, which was basically Ikea style, like, like just, it was like kitchen at cabinet style. We're gonna put a new uh, front on it. It's not gonna be super expensive. And, but they'd figured out this is Mediterranean. This is, you know, different different styles and he figured it out and the company closed his factory anyways and and he you know he's in his 70s now he came to see me when I when I read in Galax actually he came up from Georgia and he just started to cry it, he 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 was so angry when I was interviewing him that he was near tears on the phone and um, he he just feels that the company betrayed all those people and so you can, I mean, but you can find people that disagree with that. Um, I, I tried to put all the viewpoints in there, but I think what John Bassett says is probably right. I think they had to close some. I don't think they had to close them all. Um, they do have an upholstery plant in Newton, North Carolina, and they have an assembly plant um, in Martinsville, which is called Plant 11, random sounding name. And it's where they put together um, the, the imported furniture and they do um, finishes right there. And um, they can do a lot of kind of custom design stuff for the stores. The people I would most like to read your book are members of the um, Congressional Oversight, Trade Oversight Committees. And I'm wondering if in your um, talking about the book, going around, if you've heard any flickers of uh, curiosity from 
uh, members of Congress about. Yeah, I, I gave, um, Friday was National Manufacturing Day and the Alliance for American uh, Manufacturing had me come up and um, they did a really beautiful kind of book party and they invited a lot of probably your colleagues at the ITC. Were you there Friday? Okay. And um, trade lawyers and um, there were some trade enforcement folks were there and, um, and I don't remember who said what, but a lot of people asked if I would testify before Congress and I said, well, sure, nobody's asked. <laughs> I think Congress has to ask me first, but I'd, I'd be happy to, I mean, it seems the frustration with the system that like, okay, the world changed, I get that. But it seemed like the the, assist, the system, and I would love to hear your thoughts, the system to enforce it didn't change along with it. So that, for instance, in order to file an anti-dumping petition, often um, you have to show injury, first of all. And often by the time like you can show injury, you're either already super invested in importing yourselves or you're you're going broke, and so you don't have the lawyer money. So that's why I say it took an asshole with millions in the bank. I mean, he put a lot of his his personal money on the line. The other thing he had to do to file this petition is um, he had to get 51% of his industry on board. He didn't know about the law until almost it was too late to do that. And I would argue that only somebody like him would have had the gumption to sit down, I mean, literally call the CEO of every single furniture factory. He called his nephew, the CEO of Bassett, and like beg, badgered, bullied him, said, I sure would hate to see people picking in Bassett. And he was going to take out ads in the Martinsville Bulletin to tell him about this law um, because um, workers can actually bring, uh, they can file a petition themselves, but it, you know, it's a right to work state. It's not like they're unionized. And, um, but he wanted to let them know they could do that. And his, his nephew told me that story. And then once he had Stan, you know, once he had Bassett, then he could get Stanley because it was right next door. Because how bad would it look to be? To, to, would it look if you had Bassett signed on the petition but not Stanley? And Stanley ended up getting more anti-dumping duties um, uh, back through the Bird Money, the Bird Act, that um, than any of the other companies, including Von Bassett. So, uh oh, we have an actual expert in the room. I'm very nervous. Well, uh, I actually had a, the privilege of meeting. Mr. JD3, Mr. Bassett, back huh? around 2005 and 2006 okay. when I worked for the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, which is actually the agency that negotiates all those wonderful trade agreements. And I will definitely say that Mr. Bassett was by far the most memorable and colorful uh, person I ever met. Are you the met. guy that he made turn around and say, what country <laughs> do I represent? No, but... Are I do there? believe I attended that meeting. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, shoot. I wish I would have known. That but uh, um, the question... Of course, he's what into his mid seventies now, and he's going to be seventy seven. Yeah. yeah, and uh, is how directly involved is he with these, with the with the companies? And Are you com kidding? Yeah, like we've he's called three times today. Yeah. Uh, he's very involved in every decision. Um, he wakes up at four in the morning and he reads like five international newspapers on his Kindle, which he barely knows how to operate. And, and then he goes to work at the factory in Galax, which is about 45 minutes away, and um, drives his sons crazy and is really intimately involved in every detail. They've, um, they, they didn't really understand. I mean, I did this story on him, and I showed up. Doug, his son Doug had said, um, dress down. We're going to be in and out of the factory. I wore hiking boots and jeans. And my hair was long at the time. I had it back in a ponytail. And I could see the look on his. I could see the judgment. I could see he was thinking, what in the hell has the newspaper done sending this damn hippie down here to interview me? And um, he was going to give me like 10 minutes. But I was, I was totally prepared. I had done. Um, I didn't know that much about the dumping case. I knew a little bit about it. I, I mean, it's so complex. I, I knew all about the family history. I knew about the brother-in-law, the elbowing out, um, and um, and it was you know it's irresistible to tell your story to somebody who's actually interested and has done a lot of research. And then the day the newspaper article came out, I got him while he was he was super moved. He called me at eight and he was kind of in tears because he felt very affirmed because he was kind of a pariah in his industry. Like a lot of people weren't happy. A lot of people who were importing weren't happy with them because they now had to pay a little bit more for their furniture. 
and and he is kind of an asshole and so um a lot of retailers dumped him um he's starting to get some of them back now and um, he just felt very affirmed for the first time. Here was this, it was like a five page article. It had a family tree. And, um, and so w while he was really moved, I said, hey, could I write a book proposal? <laughs> and he said, sure, sure, sure. And he thought like he'd never see me again. And then I came back a couple months later and had sold it. And, and so, I mean, I didn't realize the book was gonna do as well as it did. And, um, I mean, I'm thrilled, and uh, he didn't realize it. And so what he's doing now is he's giving a lot of speeches. He's, um, um, he's going to write his own book. Um, he's, he's, somebody's going to write it for me with a ghostwriter, and um, I think that's going to happen. Like, he's, they're working on a proposal for that now uh, with my agent, actually. And um, he really thinks he has lessons to teach America about not turning tail and running and fighting back. And um, he thinks he's figured a lot of things out about how to communicate with your workers. And um, when I first met him, he would talk about his five rules for competing in the global marketplace. He now calls them his five, my five great rules. And, um, and they're pretty simple to hear him, but when he, when he gives a, I've, I've watched him when he gives lectures about his rules, he gives these great examples, and usually the first question is, will you run for president? <laughs> I mean, people just are, like, the first time you hear him speak, it's, you know, the hair on the back of your neck goes up. I mean, he's, he's got it. He's really got a lot of charisma, and, um, and I'm sure, you know, and he's, he's working really hard to uh, monetize the success of this book into furniture sales. I mean, he'd be silly not to. They've hired a public relations, um, a really sharp PR group out of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and they've got videos and all these things he would have never thought about before because he's really sort of proud of being anti-technology. I mean, he has millions of dollars worth of computerized routers and stuff, but he's proud that their, their, furni their furniture in their office is horrible and um, the, the carpet is dirty. And I asked him once because I knew, like, Spillman, his competitor, had a private jet. I said, do you have a jet? He just laughed. He thought that was so, hell no. I got rid of company cars even. You know, he's really proud of that. But he's, you know, he's spending money now to try to, um, you know, harness the, the, the PR that he can harness from the book, which is, I think, is smart. I mean, he should be, so. Uh, but, and he's selling more furniture. He's, his whole thing is like, you know, where the housing, starts haven't picked back up since the recession and that people buy bedroom furniture when they when they build new houses and that when we that starts picking up his business will pick up too and as he says at the at the beginning of this battle when he brings his sons and his team together he says imagine we're on a desert island there's 12 men and one woman and you don't have to be good looking if you're that woman you are going to get the business and so <laughs> He's saying all these other factories have closed, but we've stuck around, and we are going to get the business. Um, so I was really intrigued with Bob Spillman as a character. He seems um, you talk a lot about what he did, and he, you know, I know you didn't sort of explicitly say this, but he seems sort of like the um, if the, a story has a hero, a story sort of has a opposite of a hero. We yeah, yeah. Um, did you get a sense of what sort of motivated him internally? I mean, it, it, it seemed to be, I couldn't tell if it was just sort of, he, he knew that um, JD3 was sort of nipping at his heels and his, his position could be in danger, or was it a family thing? Was mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. something inside of him as a human being? Did you get a sense of that as you yeah, did this research? Yeah, I mean, research? the most... It, you know, because his son didn't want to be interviewed originally, and then eventually he let me in, and he really gave me some great material. And he was easier to interview, actually, than John. I mean, because you could just ask him anything, and he'd answer it, or he'd say he didn't know. I mean, I didn't get the feeling he was playing me or making me turn my recorder off every other minute. And um, and so I was just, when I finally got to him, I said, you know, I've heard a lot of really kind of bad things about your 
dad and you know I told him what they were the corporate pilot said he kicked him in a drunken rage one night you know he did this to, you know he sent John to Mount Airy uh, to make him run this to start this new plant and when he got back he took his he like had demolished his office and given it to somebody else and set him up a little strip mall with no secretary and no no real office and some really harsh things and um, and his wife nicknamed him sweet old Bob SOB and, um, but you know, his son said, you know, he, his dad left the family when he was young. Uh, uh, he, and, and he had an unhappy childhood. He had gone to military school. Um, and he was just this fierce kind of control person. And so, and then his son talked about like when he first became CEO, his dad would call him up every day and say, what the hell are you doing now? What the hell are you doing? And finally, Rob got so frustrated, he said, Dad, are we friends? And he said, oh, I guess we're friends. And he goes, well, as my friend, get the f off my back. <laughs> and he just, like, he stood up to him, and then he finally um, chilled out somewhat. And um, so I said, Rob, so finally I said, like, on my last interview, I said, I have so much more negative stuff about him than positive stuff, and I know not everybody's evil or good, and I'm really trying to flush him out as a person. And that's when he told me the story of, well, he said, you know, dad was a, just, he was a black belt ass chewer, he, he, but he, but he could get along with people you wouldn't expect him to get along to, the guy pumping your gas, and the guy from Wall Street, I mean, he could just, he was very, he was a great salesman, and, um, but he, but, but he, he said he had a great sense of humor. So to illustrate the story about how complex but kind of funny and, well, I don't know what this, I, I thought he was going to tell me something really good. But he told me the story about this plant manager named Rosenberg who ran one of the factories. And Rosenberg's wife wouldn't deign to live in Bassett. Like she was not going to live in that podunk town. So she stayed in Atlanta. So every Friday, Rosenberg wanted to get out early to drive to Atlanta because it was a long drive. And so Spillman, the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, takes it upon himself every Friday afternoon to find out where Rosenberg is. Like he's going to keep an eye. You would not, you may not leave until 5 p.m. So one day he calls down to the secretary and says, Where's the hell, where the hell's Rosenberg? And she says, he's already gone. So he calls the Virginia State Highway Patrol, and he has them set a roadblock up on the North Carolina-Virginia line, and they escort Rosenberg back to Bassett, at which point Spillman is standing in the lobby in front of the elevator looking at his watch, and he said, well, it's 5 o'clock. Have a great weekend. <laughs> and that was it. I mean, that's pretty funny, but it's pretty mean. <laughs> And another really great story, and this is maybe my favorite story of the whole book, because I had spent a lot of time researching Larry Mo, who was the first uh, Chinese furniture maker to really hit, you know, really figure out how to export to America, design the furniture bigger, you know, for Americans, and um, really, like, he was sort of the master of globalization. He was going to other countries, you know, without getting permits, and he had figured it all out way before anybody else. And so I was, I was taking a tour of Plan 11 in Martinsville with Rob the first time I interviewed him uh, in person. And uh, I said, did you ever know Larry Moe? And I can't remember what he said. He goes, oh, my, my dad did. My dad met him a couple of times. I said, what? And at this point, I knew a lot about Sweet Old Bob. And uh, I was like, oh, that's interesting. What did he think of Larry Moe? And so Rob tells me this story about it's high point. It's a big buffet party. And there's this suckling pig in the middle of this beautiful table, all elaborate, and then one of those pigs with the apple in its mouth. And, and, and he said, just apropos of nothing, in the middle of standing around having a cocktail, his dad picks up the carving knife, stabs the pig, and says, Larry Moe! He was tired of hearing his name. And I just thought, oh my god, I love that. That's just, that's so raw and like kind of, you know, unpolished and kind of bold. So, I mean, I kind of like him. I, I kind of like him as a character. Kevin Spacey could play him. I don't know. Right? Thanks. I'm, I'm almost finished with the book. It's great. Thank um, I had a question about sweet old Bob's wife, Pat, who is John's sister. Uh, Jane. Jane, Jane. Yeah. Okay. 
Pat are, now, are you from Bassett, right? No, no, I'm from here, New okay. Jersey. Originally, okay. But right. Same thing. Uh, <laughs> not, <laughs> not. <laughs> and it, there was a suggestion earlier on that that had this been a different time, yeah. she might have been running the company. Exactly. What do, you, what do you think about that? Yeah. No, I think that's exactly right. In fact, Anna Logan Lawson, who was on the board of Hollands with her when she was the chairman of the board of. Holland's University said that exact same thing. If she had born um, a couple decades later, she would have been running Bassett Furniture. Although, like, there still hasn't been a, a female running Bassett Furniture. It's a bit, um, but she was her father's favorite. I mean, she basically told me that. And she um, grew up on Sundays. They would go to church at Pocahontas Bassett Baptist Church. Their grandmother was Pocahontas Bassett, Miss Pokey. And they would go to church, and then they would stop by and kiss the grandparents who lived next door to the church in the mansion you saw. And then they would go around to the different factories, and they would check on everything. And she loved that. And she loved, like, all the details of the factories and understood the business really well. And it just, you know, it was the 50s, early 50s when she, early to mid 50s when she finished college, and, and women just didn't do that. And so some have... Um, implied or said that, you know, so she married this hard-charging executive salesperson for, he, I think he worked at Cannon Mills and was in New York when she met him, sweet old Bob, and, you know, brought him back to Bassett, and he thought he had landed in Death Valley. I mean, he was very dismissive. He wouldn't go to Pocahontas Baptist Church, and, um, you know, I asked her, I said, well, so did he talk about the factories with you? Because I knew, like, she she had, she had would come alive when she would talk about being a little girl with her father, look, checking on the factories. And, I mean, she's very bright. And I asked her, did, so did Bob, like, let, get, let you give your input? And she said no, and it broke my heart. Other people who know them very well say that wasn't true at all, that she had a lot of input. So I don't, I don't really know, you know, I'm not privy to those mm -hmm kitchen table conversations that they had but um I, I asked Rob about it and he said uh she she had said something like he used to hate Christmas and he would say oh I wish I heard the whistles blowing today the factory you know that they could be making money and uh, Rob said yeah he thought Christmas was a great waste of time <laughs> which is kind of funny so I'm from Bassett I, oh, uh, you are? I escaped in 1977. Um, What's so your I, name? Gary Ingram. It's last name? Gary Ingram. Ingram, okay. So um, most of the people in the book are, are parents of my friends, you know, one generation ahead, but a lot of them are contemporaries like Jeb Bassett. He and I were in the same class, same as uh, Hir Hir uh, Lynn Dillon, Hiram uh -huh. Dillon, Roxanne Dillon. Sure. Kids. And... Um, I guess the thing I want to ask, because, you know, the factory man discussion group that's out there, right? Yeah. Hiram posted one day, and, you know, he's fr from the family. Mm -hmm. And he asked the question or posed the question. He said, what would be a great story is the division between the family. You've mm -hmm. got the, the JD side and the CC side, mm -hmm. and they don't seem to get along very well. Did you right. uncover any of that yourself? Well, yeah, and, you know, because John was from the J.D. side, I, I didn't get as much into it. So Bassett Furniture w was founded by J.D. Bassett in 1902 with his brother, C.C., and a brother-in-law, um, and maybe a cousin, too. I think maybe there were four men initially. But it was really clear at the beginning that Mr. J.D. was, like, running the show. And Mr. C and Mr. C.C. Was, um, liked being on the farm better. And in fact, there, I found this, um, I think it was a charter for like the original Kiwanis Club or something like that. And Mr. Uh, CC listed his occupation as furniture owner. And Mr. JD wrote, capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> and so CC Bassett died in 1930 in a car accident really young. And so obviously JD is going to pass it down to his family. And then it was like, then it became this like, which side's going to get it? So then it went to his son, WM, and then to uh, Doug Bassett, John's father, who died young, well, unexpectedly um, in 1965. And then it went to... 
Mr. Ed and Spillman, and Mr. Ed was a CC side person, but Spillman really, really ran the thing. And then when Mr. Ed finally retired and wasn't chairman of the board, then just Spillman ran it, and he did both of those roles as chairman and the CEO. And so I, I know there is some tension, and I've heard people say, well, we don't have the money they have, you know, saying that about the other side. And, um, and um, I've seen that in the discussion group, too. Somebody, a friend, uh, uh, I don't even know her that well. I haven't known her that long, but she asked if she could just start a Facebook discussion group um, a week or two after the book came out. And my husband uh, is one of the administrators. And um, I said, sure. I, did, I didn't really have time to look at it every day. And uh, it quickly grew to how, how many does it have now? Over? Over a thousand. Okay, so it has probably as many people as are in Bassett. And they're almost all from Bassett, right? <laughs> There's a few people here a little bit elsewhere that are, not, that are on it. But um, somebody said, oh, it's just like a high school reunion. And it is, but it's, I mean, there's some depth in there, too. It's not just, I remember Trent Store, Trent Hill, or it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a place to, to, it's this virtual water cooler because the reality doesn't exist anymore. And I find that pretty cool. And there's some really smart discussion about globalization. People post links. Today they posted, somebody posted a link from Martinsville Bulletin about um, they closed the Bassett Country Club a couple weeks ago and somebody wants to reopen it again. It. Yeah. Yeah, and they're all sort of debating that, and and um, you know every now and then it gets it gets totally like kind of mean spirited. And Mim, our discussion leader, or Tom, will say civility, <laughs> and um, kind of bring everybody back. And um, there's probably there's a handful of people on there that hate the book, and but most of the people are pretty positive about it. Well. Re really appreciate everybody coming out. I know there's a there's a little game tonight, right? <laughs> Thank you so much.